Madam President and Vice Chancellor, colleagues, graduating students, and families, it is with great pleasure that I present to you the Honorable Judith Arola. In St. Paul, Minnesota, there's a, a plaque to commemorate the building of the first large auditorium. I would like to read two lines from, that, uh, from the inscription. Participation in the rights of citizenship pr presumes participation in the duties of citizenship. The highest expression of life is cooperative service for the common good. I believe that Mrs. Arla exemplifies those values. Born in Sudbury, her first career was in radio and television broadcasting. Starting as a copywriter on radio, it is said she did every job but engineering in the station. When the CBC television station opened, she became among the first women employed by a Canadian station on air. Mrs. Arla and her late husband ran a marina, providing her uh, experience in the world of small business. While raising two daughters, one of whom is here, she went back to radio, writing uh, advertising copy, and rising to an executive of the station. Her national public service career began in, uh, in 1980 when she became MP for Nickel Belt. She was the Minister of Mines, uh, Minister responsible for the status of women, uh, and, and she was among the first women appointed to the Cabinet uh, Priorities and Planning uh, Committee. Many of my colleagues, retired or still in the public service, remember her penetrating questions and fair-minded approach. Her longtime friend and colleague, the Honorable Monique Bejan, wrote that Mrs. Arola uh, championed the mining industry, the greening of Sudbury, not to mention the equity clause in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. After leaving politics, she became the president of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers of Canada, now RxD, and served on a number of corporate boards. Honored many times in the past, I want to focus on her, on her work to promote dialogue between government, the private sector, and civil society. The issue of private uh, sector involvement in health, controversial today, was much more so 10 or 20 years ago. She did not hesitate to get involved in the thorny debates between academic medicine, physicians, and pharmaceutical companies. Canada does not do well at getting research translated to the economy, and arguably her initiatives led to new programs for supporting academic work. The Canadian Institute of Child Health has greatly benefited from Mrs. Erla's input and support. The CICH is known for producing reliable information for public policy, for parents, and, for, and again for bridging the gap. Under her watch, the CICH has, has recognized the contributions of individuals and sometimes companies when this, is, when this was uh, deserved. Over the past decade, Mrs. Errol has promoted a stronger relationship between CICH and Carleton and contributed in an important way to the regulatory governance initiative. Mrs. Errol has been a leader in broadcasting, public service, health promotion, and public administration. I believe that she captures the values of this university. Madam Vice Chancellor, in recognition of the outstanding and exemplary service in political and public life, the building of civil society, and continuing engagement with Carleton University, I request that you confer the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, upon Judith Erla. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Faculty Senate and our board, I hereby award you the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, with all the privileges and responsibilities therein pertaining. Congratulations. <laughs>Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. I'm very humbled to, uh, to be here and, uh, and to hear those remarks. I, uh, 
I want to say, first of all, that I am also very privileged to be sharing this platform with these distinguished guests. Madam uh, President, Madam Chair, who is also a fellow Northerner, platform guests, and also Chancellor Herb Gray. Now, he's not here, and you'll say, why? Well, last night I saw Mr. Gray, and he is not, um, uh, not well, so he said he would be unable to attend the convocation today. And I said, too bad, because I was going to say some nice things about him. And he said, we'll say them anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to. The Chancellor is an old colleague and a fabulous Canadian who served one of the longest terms ever in the House of Commons, who is probably the fairest man I have ever known in my life, and who I can say with firm conviction is a feminist. So I'm very proud to, uh, to say that he is my friend. So, congratulations, felicitations. What a joyous day for you. And it's just so wonderful to see you. And I know how hard you've worked to get to this stage and how much your parents had hoped this day would come. Well, it's here. I also am honored to be associated with this university and to have worked with so many of, of your faculty here. And to say that they are absolutely exemplary citizens of Ottawa, the country, and this university and what they do behind the scenes to further the cause of students and the cause of science and the cause of learning here in Canada. I'm particularly pleased to be associated with the, the Arthur Kroger School of Public Affairs. I am fortunate enough, or maybe just old enough, to have benefited from the wisdom of Arthur Kroger, who was what I called the consummate civil service. He served in so many posts in government, both as, um, as, as an advisor, a most incredible uh, institutional memory, and just simply a wise man. Which brings me to the, the gist of today's remarks. Don't worry, I'm not going to take too much of your time. I have a grandson who was on the cusp of graduation. I think he's, yeah, he should be here today, and he said, not too long, now. You've had enough uh, long-winded lectures with all respect to your professors, so <laughs> we won't go there. I do wish to speak to you for a few minutes about my past. I hope it's not too boring, and what it has to do with your future, where I hope that some of you will go. So today I'm going to praise public service. And I'm going to do it in terms of both the, the civil servants who reside here in such numbers in Ottawa, and from the politician's point of view. Now my remarks are strictly personal. Much has been studied and written about the relationship between uh, ministers and senior civil servants. And I'm not going to pretend that this is anything but a, a, a personal observation based on my experiences. Well, first of all, let's deal the subject of the, of, of the way a, a minister is addressed, always minister. And I puzzled about this, and I did some reading, and they said the, they're always called minister because it's simply a good way to define the professional politician from the professional bureaucrat. Personally, I think it's easier for the bureaucrat because the speed with which ministers change, particularly in recent years, makes it impossible to remember their names. So on a, a more serious note, and, and it's happening now in Ottawa, and if there are any senior civil servants here, they know what I'm talking about. Incoming politicians are being programmed. And the politicians themselves have been programmed from the past, uh, especially the first time ones, to, be, uh, to expect the relationship between the uh, bureaucracy and the politician to be somewhat rocky. They come in thinking that the bureaucracy is immovable, solid, immersed in its own culture, not to mention just a little suspicious of uh, the loyalty to the previous party that was in power. Well, in my experience, nothing could be further from the truth. To be sure, as a new minister moves in, 
It's a sweeping learning curve on both sides. On one side, everybody in the, in the department and every department in, in Ottawa is trying to find out everything they can know about this new minister. Where is she from? Where did he get his education? What's his background? In short, what does this animal eat in the winter? Well, the briefing books are prepared and the long sessions go on and on and on. Teaching the neophyte minister the details that are looming, the, the, all of the issues that involve their particular departments have to be mastered before that momentous day when the house opens and the minister faces the music. And I can assure you, it is daunting. In my case, Prime Minister Trudeau, in all his wisdom, named me a Minister of State Minds to be tutored by a master politician, Marc Lalonde. Marc had been both a civil servant and a politician, and what a tutorial it was. I can assure you that I got a political science PhD in three months. There was no doubt that senior ministers are also mentors. In my case, Marc Lalonde and Monique Bégin were, and still are, my most memorable professors. Marc Lalonde taught me the system, he knew it inside and out, and Monique bolstered my political courage and has been my friend for life. My first portfolio plunged me into an area of government I never even knew existed. Who knew what earth sciences entailed? Well, everything I discovered. Everything, it seemed, from earthquakes to icebergs. At that time, energy mines and resources housed world-renowned experts in the sciences that affect all of us, past, present, and future. They were phenomenal scientists who took it upon themselves to cram into my head as much knowledge as my cranium could absorb. The National Geographic Survey, which formed this country. The Polar Continental Shelf Project, that was really the basis for Arctic so sovereignty. Understanding of the Arctic, the oceans, the atmosphere, energy uh, requirements now and forever. I learned about the tar sands 35 years ago. And these were all subjects of not much interest to the general public much less to the politician. And of course the difference is that the professional civil servant does and must think in the long term where the politician has at best a four-year horizon. But it is the job of the civil service to keep the minister informed also of daily events that are likely to prompt questions in the House. And it was my experience that they take considerable pride in the minister's capacity and ability to make appropriate responses. How embarrassing for them if their minister doesn't have the right answer in the House. They failed. A new minister with an agenda that may be fraught with problems will be uh, firmly advised of the consequences of moving too hastily. This is not hostility on behalf of the civil service. That's their job. My first brush with this situation resulted in a very spirited discussion. Okay, we had a fight. A fight that, in the end, assured me that we were on our way to a truthful and productive course. They earned my trust, my respect, and today I wish to express my thanks to them and hope that the scientists of their caliber continue to exist today because we need them. They're all truly unsung heroes. Was there ever a time when I decided to override the admonitions of the bureaucrat? Yes, and I haven't really admitted this to many people before. You get to a certain age, it doesn't matter much after, does it? During the defense of the Equality Clause and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which had been so effectively sliced out of the Charter, on the night of the, the Equality Clause sliced out of the Charter on the night of the Long Knives. Nobody, no, no student here was, were you alive then? Yes, barely. <laughs> but at that time, 
Section 28, which is the Equality Clause, had been taken out of the, um, of the charter overnight, m mostly because of provincial premiers who decided that they really didn't want to mess with that. Well, it wasn't messing. It was the foundation of uh, uh, a, a major building block of our charter and our, our civil society. And I was hopping mad. So I promised Prime Minister Trudeau that I, while I would not go public in my opposition to the agreement because I would this be breaking um, cabinet solidarity, I made it clear that I would use every tool available to unite the women of Canada to re reinstate Section 28 by convincing the provincial premiers that they had to put it back. Well, that meant using both my political office and the status of women government resources to mobilize and coordinate the protest across the country. It was guerrilla warfare, let me tell you. And I had the nonpartisan support. And believe me, we do have issues that, that gain nonpartisan support in the House. I had the support of other women politicians, Flora MacDonald and Pauline Jewett, who whipped their caucuses into shape. And let me tell you, it took some whipping. So every possible resource was employed. However, in the midst of this melee, the senior bureaucrat at the Status of Women uh, warned me, and it was her job, that by using the Status of Women government offices, I would be violating the rules and I would seriously jeopardize my ministerial position. Well, I threw caution to the wind, knowing that at the end of the day, if women had no status, there wasn't much point in being the minister responsible for the status of women. And I made that point to the Prime Minister very clearly before we started, so I knew what the results would be if we failed. Well, after 10 very tough days, the provincial premiers, badgered by the women of Canada, and I mean badgered, they marched across the country to the provincial capitals and, uh, and, and never let go until, one by one, the provincial premiers said, OK. They gave up. No one called me to task. There was no special parliamentary investigation into my use of these offices. I never heard a word from anyone. But there were a few sore losers around in the House of Commons. All this to say that a career in government, particularly in Canadian government, whether the route is political or the public service, can be exciting, challenging, and extremely rewarding. So please, please, don't fall into the trap of cynicism and disenchantment. There's no, no room for that. And when I look at your smiling, enthusiastic faces, I don't think any of those apply to you. You can make changes, and I, I'm firmly convinced that you will make changes. Life in Ottawa is a hotbed of ideas. Yes, gossip and intrigue, fed again much by the media. But I can assure you that it is never, never dull. So I hope that some of you will consider a career in the public service, take the big political risk, run for office. It's exhilarating. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I've done both. But you might also try to look at a career in the civil service, because it too is extremely rewarding. And the pay's not bad. Either way, you will serve your country well. Above all, continue to be curious, creative, courageous. You have all the tools. Work with them. Thank you.